This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlords of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs and read by J. D. Weber on the south shores of Lake Superior. Chapter 7 New Allies Surrounded by guardsmen, I marched back along the corridors of the palace of Kulan Tith, Jeddak of Kaul, to the great audience chamber in the center of the massive structure. As I entered the brilliantly lighted apartment, filled with the nobles of Kaul and the officers of the visiting Jeddak, all eyes were turned upon me. Upon the great dais, at the end of the chamber, stood three thrones, upon which sat Kulan Tith and his two guests, Mata Shang and the visiting Jeddak. Up the broad center aisle we marched beneath deadly silence. At the foot of the thrones we halted. "'Prefer thy charge,' said Kulantith, turning to one who stood among the nobles at his right. And then Thuid, the black dator of the firstborn, stepped forward and faced me. "'Most noble Jeddak,' he said, addressing Kulantith, "'from the first I suspected this stranger within thy palace, your description of his fiendish prowess tallied with that of the arch-enemy of truth upon Barsoom.' but that there might be no mistake, I dispatched a priest of your own holy cult to make the test that should pierce his disguise and reveal the truth. Behold the result. And Thuard pointed a rigid finger at my forehead. All eyes followed the direction of that accusing digit. I alone seemed at loss to guess what fatal sign rested upon my brow. The officer beside me guessed my perplexity, and as the brows of Kulan Tith darkened in a menacing scowl as his eyes rested upon me, the noble drew a small mirror from his pocket pouch and held it before my face. One glance at the reflection it gave back to me was sufficient. From my forehead the hand of the sneaking thern had reached out through the concealing darkness of my bedchamber and wiped away a patch of the disguising red pigment as broad as my palm. Beneath showed the tan texture of my own white skin. For a moment, Thuard ceased speaking to enhance, I suspect, the dramatic effect of his disclosure. Then he resumed. Here, O Kulantith, he cried, is he who has desecrated the temples of the gods of Mars, who has violated the persons of the holy therns themselves, and turned a world against its age-old religion. Before you, in your power, Jeddak of Kaul, defender of the holies, stands John Carter, prince of Helium. Kulan Tith looked toward Mata Shang as though for corroboration of these charges. The Holy Thern nodded his head. It is indeed the arch blasphemer, he said. Even now he has followed me to the very heart of thy palace, Kulan Tith, for the sole purpose of assassinating me. He, he lies, I cried. Kulan Tith, listen that you may know the truth. Listen while I tell you why John Carter has followed Mata Shang to the heart of thy palace. Listen to me as well as to them and then judge if my acts be not more in accord with true Barsoomian chivalry and honor than those of these revengeful devotees of the spurious creeds from whose cruel bonds I have freed your planet. Silence! roared the Jeddak, leaping to his feet and laying his hand upon the hilt of his sword. Silence, blasphemer! Kulan Tith need not permit the air of his audience chamber to be defiled by the heresies that issue from your polluted throat to judge you. You stand already self-condemned. It but remains to determine the manner of your death. Even the service that you rendered the arms of Kaul shall avail you not. It was but a base subterfuge whereby you might win your way into my favor and reach the side of this holy man whose life you craved. To the pits with him, he concluded, addressing the officer of my guard. Here was a pretty pass indeed. What chance had I against a whole nation? What hope for me of mercy at the hands of the fanatical Kulan Tith with such advisers as Mata Shang and Thuard? The black grinned malevolently in my face. You shall not escape this time, Earthman, he taunted. The guards closed toward me. A red haze blurred my vision. The fighting blood of my Virginian sires coursed hot through my veins. The lust of battle in all its mad fury was upon me. With a leap I was beside Thuard, and ere the devilish smirk had faded from his handsome face, I had caught him full upon the mouth with my clinched fist, and as the good old American blow landed, the black detour shot back a dozen feet, to crumple in a heap at the foot of Kulan Tith's throne, spitting blood and teeth from his hurt mouth. Then I drew my sword and swung round, on guard, to face a nation. 
In an instant the guardsmen were upon me, but before a blow had been struck a mighty voice rose above the din of shouting warriors, and a giant figure leaped from the dais beside Kulan Tith, and with drawn longsword threw himself between me and my adversaries. It was the visiting Jeddak. Hold, he cried, if you value my friendship, Kulan Tith, and the age-old peace that has existed between our peoples, call off your swordsmen. For wherever, or against whomsoever, fights John Carter, Prince of Helium, there beside him, and to the death, fights Thuvan Din, Jeddak of Parth. The shouting ceased, and the menacing points were lowered as a thousand eyes turned first toward Thuvan Din, in surprise, and then toward Kulan Tith, in question. At first the Jeddak of Kaul went white in rage, but before he spoke he had mastered himself, so that his tone was calm and even as befitted intercourse between two great Jeddaks. Thuvan Din, he said slowly, must have great provocation thus to desecrate the ancient customs which inspire the deportment of a guest within the palace of his host, lest I, too, should forget myself as has my royal friend, I should prefer to remain silent until the Jeddak of Parth has won from me applause for his action by relating the causes which provoked it. I could see that the Jeddak of Parth was of half mind to throw his medal in Kulan Tith's face, but he controlled himself even as well as had his host. None knows better than Thuvan Din, he said, the laws which govern the acts of men in the domains of their neighbors. But Thuvan Din owes allegiance to a higher law than these the law of gratitude. Nor to any man upon Barsoom does he owe a greater debt of gratitude than to John Carter, Prince of Helium. Years ago, Kulantith, he continued, upon the occasion of your last visit to me, you were greatly taken with the charms and graces of my only daughter, Thuvia. You saw how I adored her, and later you learned that, inspired by some unfathomable whim, she had taken the last long voluntary pilgrimage upon the cold bosom of the mysterious Ish, leaving me desolate. Some months ago I first heard of the expedition which John Carter had led against Ishus and the Holy Therns. Faint rumors of the atrocities reported to have been committed by the Therns upon those who for countless ages have floated down the mighty Ish came to my ears. I heard that thousands of prisoners had been released, few of whom dared to return to their own countries owing to the mandate of terrible death which rests against all who return from the valley door. For a time I could not believe the heresies which I heard, and I prayed that my daughter, Thuvia, might have died before she ever committed the sacrilege of returning to the outer world. But then my father's love asserted itself, and I vowed that I would prefer eternal damnation to further separation from her if she could be found. So I sent emissaries to Helium, and to the court of Exodar, Jeddak of the firstborn and to him who now rules those of the third nation that have renounced their religion. And from each and all I heard the same story of unspeakable cruelties and atrocities perpetuated upon the poor defenseless victims of their religion by the holy therns. Many there were who had seen or known my daughter, and from therns who had been close to Mata Shang, I learned of the indignities that he personally heaped upon her, and I was glad when I came here to find that Mata Shang was also your guest, for I should have sought him out had it taken a lifetime. More, too, I heard, and that of the chivalrous kindness that John Carter had accorded my daughter. They told me how he fought for her and rescued her, and how he spurned escape from the savage war hoons of the South, sending her to safety upon his own thoat, and remaining upon foot to meet the green warriors. Can you wonder, Kulan Tith? that I am willing to jeopardize my life, the peace of my nation, or even your friendship, which I prize more than aught else, to champion the Prince of Helium? For a moment Kulan Tith was silent. I could see by the expression of his face that he was sore perplexed. Then he spoke. Thuvan Din, he said, and his tone was friendly, though sad. Who am I to judge my fellow man? In my eyes the father of Therns is still holy, and the religion which he teaches the only true religion. But were I faced by the same problem that has vexed you, I doubt not that I should feel and act precisely as you have. In so far as the Prince of Helium is concerned, I may act. But between you and Mata Shang, my only office can be one of conciliation. The Prince of Helium shall be escorted in safety to the boundary of my domain, ere the sun has set again, where he shall be free to go whither he will. 
but upon pain of death must he never again enter the land of Kaul. If there be a quarrel between you and the father of Therns, I need not ask that the settlement of it be deferred until both have passed beyond the limits of my power. Are you satisfied, Thuvandin? The Jeddak of Parth nodded his assent, but the ugly scowl that he bent upon Mata Shang harbored ill for that pasty-faced godling. The Prince of Helium is far from satisfied, I cried, breaking rudely in upon the beginnings of peace, for I had no stomach for peace at the price that had been named. I have escaped death in a dozen forms to follow Mata Shang and overtake him, and I do not intend to be led like a decrepit thoat to the slaughter, from the goal that I have won by the prowess of my sword-arm and the might of my muscles. Nor will Thuvan Din, Jeddak of Parth, be satisfied when he has heard me through. Do you know why I have followed Mata Shang and Thuard the Black Detour from the forest of the valley door across half a world through almost insurmountable difficulties? Think you that John Carter, Prince of Helium, would stoop to assassination? Can Kulan Tith be such a fool as to believe that lie whispered in his ear by the Holy Thern or Detour Thuard? I do not follow Mata Shang to kill him, though the god of mine own planet knows that my hands itch to be at his throat. I follow him, Thuvan Din, because with him are two prisoners, my wife, Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium, and your daughter, Thuvia of Parth. Now think you that I shall permit myself to be led beyond the walls of Kaul unless the mother of my son accompanies me and thy daughter be restored? Thuvan Din turned upon Kulan Tith. Rage flamed in his keen eyes, but by the masterfulness of his self-control he kept his tones level as he spoke. Knew you this thing, Kulan Tith? he asked. Knew you that my daughter lay a prisoner in your palace? He could not know it, interrupted Mata Shang, white with what I am sure was more fear than rage. He could not know it, for it is a lie. I would have had his life for that upon the spot, but even as I sprang toward him, Thuvan Din laid a heavy hand upon my shoulder. Wait, he said to me, and then to Kulan Tith. It is not a lie. This much have I learned of the Prince of Helium. He does not lie. Answer me, Kulan Tith. I have asked you a question. Three women came with the father of Therns, replied Kulan Tith, Feodor his daughter, and two who were reported to be her slaves. If these be Thuvia of Parth, and Deja Thoris of Helium, I did not know it. I have seen neither. But if they be, then shall they be returned to you on the morrow. As he spoke, he looked straight at Mata Shang, not as a devotee should look at a high priest, but as a ruler of men looks at one to whom he issues a command. It must have been plain to the father of Therns, as it was to me, that the recent disclosures of his true character had done much already to weaken the faith of Kulan Tith, and that it would require but little more to turn the powerful Jeddak into an avowed enemy. But so strong are the seeds of superstition that even the great Kaulian still hesitated to cut the final strand that bound him to his ancient religion. Mata Shang was wise enough to seem to accept the mandate of his follower, and promised to bring the two slave women to the audience chamber on the morrow. It is almost morning now, he said, and I should dislike to break in upon the slumber of my daughter, or I would have them fetched at once that you might see that the Prince of Helium is mistaken. And he emphasized the last word in an effort to affront me so subtly that I could not take open offense. I was about to object to any delay, and demand that the princess of Helium be brought to me forthwith, when Thuvan Din made such insistence seem unnecessary. I should like to see my daughter at once, he said, but if Kulan Tith will give me his assurance that none will be permitted to leave the palace this night, and that no harm shall befall either Deja Thoris or Thuvi of Parth between now and the moment they are brought into our presence in this chamber at daylight, I shall not insist. None shall leave the palace tonight, replied the Jeddak of Kaul and Mata Shang will give us assurance that no harm will come to the two women. The thern ascended with a nod. A few moments later Kulan Tith indicated that the audience was at an end, and at Thuvan Din's invitation I accompanied the Jeddak of Parth to his own apartments, where we sat until daylight, while he listened to the account of my experiences upon his planet and to all that had befallen his daughter during the time that we had been together. I found the father of Thuvia a man after my own heart, and that night saw the beginning of a friendship which has grown until it is second only to that which obtains between Tars Tarkas, the green Jeddak of Thark, and myself. 
The first burst of Mars's sudden dawn brought messengers from Kulan Tith, summoning us to the audience chamber where Thuvan Din was to receive his daughter after years of separation, and I was to be reunited with the glorious daughter of Helium after almost an unbroken separation of twelve years. My heart pounded within my bosom until I looked about me in embarrassment. So sure was I that all within the room must hear. My arms ached to enfold once more the divine form of who whose eternal youth and undying beauty were but outward manifestations of a perfect soul. At last the messenger dispatched to fetch Mata Shang returned. I craned my neck to catch the first glimpse of those who should be following, but the messenger was alone. Halting before the throne, he addressed his jeddak in a voice that was plainly audible to all within the chamber. O Kulantith, mightiest of jeddaks, he cried, after the fashion of the court, your messenger returns alone, for when he reached the apartments of the father of therns, he found them empty, as were those occupied by his suite. Kulantith went white. A low groan burst from the lips of Thuvan Din, who stood next to me not having ascended the throne which awaited him beside his host. For a moment the silence of death reigned in the great audience chamber of Kulan Tith, Jeddak of Kaul. It was he who broke the spell. Rising from his throne, he stepped down from the dais to the side of Thuvan Din. Tears dimmed his eyes as he placed both his hands upon the shoulders of his friend. O Thuvan Din, he cried, that this should have happened in the palace of thy best friend, with my own hands would I have wrung the neck of Mata Shang had I guessed what was in his foul heart. Last night my lifelong faith was weakened. This morning it has been shattered. But too late, too late, to wrest your daughter and the wife of this royal warrior from the clutches of these archfiends, you have but to command the resources of a mighty nation. For all Kaul is at your disposal. What may be done? Say the word. First, I suggested, let us find those of your people who be responsible for the escape of Mata Shang and his followers. Without assistance on the part of the palace guard, this thing could not have come to pass. Seek the guilty, and from them force an explanation of the manner of their going and the direction they have taken. Before Kulan Tith could issue the commands that would initiate the investigation, a handsome young officer stepped forward and addressed his jeddak. O Kulan Tith, mightiest of jeddaks, he said, I alone be responsible for this grievous error. Last night it was I who commanded the palace guard. I was on duty in other parts of the palace during the audience of the early morning, and knew nothing of what transpired then, so that when the father of Thurm summoned me and explained that it was your wish that his party be hastened from the city because of the presence here of a deadly enemy who sought the holy Hecador's life, I did only what a lifetime of training has taught me was the proper thing to do. I obeyed him whom I believed to be the ruler of us all, mightier even than thou, mightiest of jeddaks. Let the consequences and the punishment fall on me alone, for I alone am guilty. Those others of the palace guard who assisted in the flight did so under my instructions. Kulan Tith looked first at me and then at Thuvan Din, as though to ask our judgment upon the man. But the air was so evidently excusable that neither of us had any mind to see the young officer suffer for a mistake that any might readily have made. How left they? asked Duvan Din, and what direction did they take? They left as they came, replied the officer, upon their own flyer. For some time after they had departed I watched the vessel's lights, which vanished finally due north. Where north could Mata Shang find an asylum? asked Duvan Din of Kulan Tith. For some moments the jeddak of Kaul stood with bowed head apparently deep in thought. Then a sudden light brightened his countenance. I have it, he cried. Only yesterday Mata Shang let drop a hint of his destination, telling me of a race of people unlike ourselves who dwell far to the north. They, he said, had always been known to the holy therns and were devout and faithful followers of the ancient cult. Among them would he find a perpetual haven of refuge where no lying heretics might seek him out. It is there that Mata Shang has gone. And in all Kaul there be no flyer wherein to follow, I cried. No nearer than Parth, replied Thuvan Din. Wait, I exclaimed. Beyond the southern fringe of this great forest lies the wreck of the Thern flyer which brought me that far upon my way. If you will loan me men to fetch it, and artificers to assist me, I can repair it in two days, Kulantith. 
I have been more than half suspicious of the seeming sincerity of the Kaulian Jetic's sudden apostasy, but the alacrity with which he embraced my suggestion, and the dispatch with which a force of officers and men were placed at my disposal entirely removed the last vestige of my doubts. Two days later the flyer rested upon the top of the watchtower, ready to depart. Thuvandin and Kulantith had offered me the entire resources of two nations. Millions of fighting men were at my disposal, but my flyer could hold but one other than myself and Wula. As I stepped aboard her, Thuvandin took his place beside me. I cast a look of questioning surprise upon him. He turned to the highest of his own officers who had accompanied him to Kaul. "'To you I entrust the return of my retinue to Parth,' he said. "'There my son rules ably in my absence. "'The prince of Helium shall not go alone into the land of his enemies. "'I have spoken. Farewell.'" End of chapter 7